Huh, Philosopher's Iceberg. Seems interesting. Um, let's check the comments out. Wait, who? What the? Okay, so today we are going through the Philosopher's Iceberg. If you don't know how this works, is then let me tell you. So basically, the deeper down the iceberg you go, more obscure the entries become. Understood? Well, let's begin. Level 1 Socrates One of the most famous philosophers in history, as he was the founder of Western philosophy. In his young age, he wasn't actually a philosopher but a soldier instead, but goddamn he became the questioner of everything. The Socratic method became a unique way of debating and clarifying questions. He didn't write anything by himself, but had two students who wrote his life accounts. Though there is an argument over which one is the true Socrates. Anyhow, the most well-known quotation from Socrates was that, I know that I know nothing. Well, if you don't know about him, then you're probably following the Socratic path right. Plato He's one of the two students I was talking about, if it isn't obvious already. He's famously known for writing the dialogues of Socrates, although it is said that in later dialogues, he used Socrates as a mouthpiece to convey his own ideas. Plato had a fascination with distinguishing between the experience and the ideal form, which came to be known as the theory of forms, where the real world is not the true, timeless world but the shadow of the true reality of forms. These forms are abstract, perfect and unchanging. While in his work The Republic, he came up with a civilization ruled by the big brain philosopher instead of a small brain one. Karl Marx A pretty big jump from the ancient Greek to the 19th century. But Daddy Marx returns with his revolutionary ideas. He was brought up in Berlin, got inspired by Engels, moved to France, became a revolutionist and finally met Engels to collab and write the Marxist masterpiece known as the Communist Manifesto, which literally rewrote history as we know. He argued that the whole of human history was based on the class system, where one of the class struggled against another until one disappeared and the other rose. Ultimately, the proletariat will be the last class to struggle and rule. Also, don't forget about the capital where he tried to roast capitalism through empirical and theoretical evidence. But despite his effort, capitalism still prevails. Albert Camus In a million years, a philosopher is born who actually, for once, has a high sex appeal. That is Albert Camus, or what I like to call him, Chad Camus. Born in 1913, he came to be the admirer of literature and philosophy. His debut novel, The Stranger and Most Writings, portrayed an isolated character in an alien universe who were to be estranged by their own existence. Most specifically in his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, he examined nihilism and eventually came to find the chaos, the irrationality, and the absurd. Thus his philosophy of absurdism was founded, where one faces the disharmony between the individual search of meaning and the meaningless world. To solve the problem, there are three ways which are escaping existence, religion, and acceptance of the absurd. Although it was truly sad that such a chad was killed in a car crash. John Paul Sartre The French theme continues with Sartre. He was small-statured and cross-eyed, but that did not stop him from being the leading French philosopher of the 20th century. His first philosophical novel, Nausea, which critics defined as a pathological case of neurotic escape. In his great work, Being and Consciousness, where he defined two opposites which were being and thingness against nothing and consciousness. Thus he came to the conclusion that if consciousness was not a being then it was affected by the deterministic world. He said existentialism is a humanism, because human beings express their power of free will through it. He further stated that human created his own meaning through undertaking the projects in the real world. Well, time to revert my existential crisis. Level 2 Aristotle And so it continues with the student of Plato. I mean he should be on top of the list considering his contribution to every aspect of human knowledge. But I'm too lazy to make my own list. Most of Aristotle's work is considered to be lost, but what survives is divided into four parts, which is set of logical tools for philosophical and scientific inquiry. 
theoretical work or animals, an examination about the nature of matter and change, and a quasi-theological investigation of existence itself. I can blabber on about Aristotle for a long time, but let's move on for now. Immanuel Kant The first thing that comes to mind upon hearing his name is to make an inappropriate joke, but here on this channel we are family friendly. Well, that was a lie. His works were around epistemology, ethics and aesthetics which influenced the idealist school of thought. He brought philosophy to the new era of rational thought along Descartes. Although his earlier writings and dissertations were more mathematics and physics based, but after developing his philosophy, he came to write the three critiques. His most important work was the Critique of Pure Reason, where he explained how reason and experience interact with thought and understanding. Though, in the end what I learned from Kant was to follow the categorical imperative and investigate the limits and powers of reason. Nope, but what I actually learned was to tie my wrists to the bedpost so I could stop myself from wanking. Thomas Hobbes He lived an exceptionally long life of 91, especially considering he was born in 1588, and what's more surprising is that he wrote the Leviathan at age 63. The core idea it discussed was the way a man could abandon the natural state of fear and violence by giving up his natural freedom and by forming a contract with an authority. This authority was to be sovereign and absolute until it upholds a contract. This was the social contract theory, but ironically the authorities didn't seem to like his ideas. I mean he does look like the villain from the Saw movie. Martin Heidegger well, what to say other than that he explored the main question of human existence through the concepts of time and death. His complex book Being and Time could be summarized in one word, which is design, meaning being there. He defined an individual as a mere thinking subject, who is radically different from the world around, thus cognitively isolated from it. The concepts are hard to wrap your head around, but once comprehended, the ontological concepts of the world, everydayness and being with others are easier to digest. In later life, Heidegger became uncertain about whether philosophy could clearly explain the truth of being or not. Michel Foucault The mad lad who embraced communism and then abandoned it. But that's not what we are here to talk about, but that he was one of the most controversial philosophers of the post-World War era, as he gave rise to the queer theory. His main success came from the 1996 to 1984 when he wrote several of his masterpieces including Discipline and Punish, The Order of Things and The History of Sexuality. Foucault explored the contingency of history to create a genealogy of power. He questioned how knowledge and power merged in practice, for example in regulation of governing bodies and formation of self. He further discussed how one is governed and controlled by the development of knowledge over history, what he named as the technologies of power. In short, history is a play of BDSM. Level 3 Friedrich Nietzsche I know what the first comment on this video will be. Oh, Nietzsche should be higher. Well, deal with it. Nietzsche had a short but a brilliant tenure of writing as insanity literally took the best out of him. He mostly wrote on the individuality and morality in the contemporary civilization, but specifically taught an individual through creative drive and will to power could become Ubermensch. Basically, a person who pursues to exist beyond traditional values of good and evil. The idea comes from thus spoke Zarathustra, where Zarathustra brings the message to the people, but is laughed at. That was sad, but what is sadder are the people who call themselves deep thinker by quoting, God is dead, and we killed him. Arthur Schopenhauer The philosopher of the pessimist, who inspired Nietzsche, he was primarily significant due to his metaphysical doctrine of the will put up against the Hegelian idealism. Schopenhauer mixed Hindu Vedas with Plato and Kant in order to create his own philosophy. His fundamental work was The World as Will and Idea, which was made into four books over the theory of knowledge, the philosophy of nature, aesthetics and ethics. In the first two, he discussed how man made the world comprehensible through the creation of space, time and casuality. But these creations only showed world externally, but not a thing in itself. He further discussed how person's will is the thing in itself which exists beyond space and time. Man is driven by the restless desires and faces chain of struggles and misery, which at end faces death. Consequently, the will to live is challenged, thus posing a question to everyone. Have you had enough? 
René Descartes. Another man makes life an agony through math, but rather not think about it. Descartes in Discourse on Method argues about the foundation of knowledge, the existence of God and distinguished between the body and the soul. Him being a mathematician resulted in him coming up with a method of doubt in order to gain specific knowledge. Descartes argued that even if sensory experiences were deceiving us, even then we can reach certain knowledge knowing that we were thinking. Thus his quotation, I think, therefore I am. He did not try to establish whether the world or the external body was real, but tried to reveal how we can gain certain insight about the world. Now the only rationalist left is Spinoza, but a chart maker did not include him, so better to skip another mathematical journey. Yay! Yeah, I'm pretty gassed about it, as you can see. John Locke He brought the fresh air to the ending world of Middle Ages. He was the leading figure of the Age of Enlightenment and in process ended up playing foundations for the liberalism, being a key advocate of empirical approach thus in his work. As a concerning human understanding, he proposed the theory of tabula rasa, where a mind at birth is a blank page, but through sensory experiences, one gains knowledge. His political philosophy was of huge impact on coming authorities, as in two treaties of government, he stated that king had no divine right, thus should be removed once the society agrees to do so. He also stated the three natural rights of the man, which were life, liberty and property, ultimately influencing the founding constitution of America. Looks like Americans have someone to thank to. Edmund Husserl You've heard about the phenomenology. Well, this is the guy who found it. Got it? Nice. Husserl tried to resolve the opposition between rationalism and empiricism. Thus in his work, Ideas, General Introduction to Phenomenology, he tried to bring a new style to the transcendental philosophy and tried to improve on Kant's mediation on empiricism and rationalism. Husserl came to focus on the basic experiences which led to the essence of things, while he also focused on how an essence became consciousness. His efforts were misunderstood by many thinking that he was just copying Kant, but he later on proved everyone wrong by clearing the misunderstanding in his book Formal and Transcendental Logic. Husserl be like, later on suckers! Ludwig Wittgenstein he contributed hugely to the 20th century's philosophical conversation, but most importantly he was the mad lad who debunked the theories he himself came up with. For example, in treaties on logic and philosophy, he came up with a representational theory of language where he described the world as a collection of facts which we can picture in language, assuming that language was logically based. But he took a turn in the philosophical investigations where he saw the language not as fixed but fluid structure, changing with our daily life. Thus language was not logically based but rather how we used it. Maybe it is easy to understand this in his own words. He says, it ain't what you say, it's the way that you say it and the context in which you say it. Words are how you use them. Level 4 Soren Kierkegaard One cannot be existentialist and devoted to religion, but Kierkegaard seemed to reject such a statement. He was brought up in a confused household with his father impregnating his maid and then marrying her after his first wife's death. Well, now I get it why Kierkegaard was such an oddball. He opposed Hegelianism of his day, disagreeing with the lack of individual worth, thus he placed individuality at the center of his own philosophy. He believed man stood alone in isolation and for him to believe in an unknowable god, he needs to take the leap of faith. In his book Stages on Life's Way, he provided three types of existence which included the aesthetic, ethical and religious. Bertrand Russell He was a British polymath, philosopher, logician, mathematician, historian, writer, social activist, political activist and a Nobel laureate. But what is the nerdiest thing about him is that he fell in love with Euclidean geometry at age 11. What a nerd! He developed classical logic in principle of mathematics. He wrote how math was a branch of logic stating if all mathematical terms could be well defined, then truth or falsity of each statement can be evaluated through pure logic. He also developed logical atomism alongside his student Ludwig Wittgenstein. Surprise surprise! He also tried to improve Aristotle's syllogisms by adding some seasoning of Boolean algebra. Now what the fuck is Boolean algebra you ask? Well search it online, I'm not a maths channel. 
Sigmund Freud. He is regarded as one of the most influential yet controversial minds of the 20th century. His most important development was the psychoanalysis, a practice to treat an individual with mental illness. He developed the theory of unconsciousness, which presents that big chunk of human behaviors can be explained through the activity of the mind, which isn't clearly visible. The unusual attitude can be explained through the observation. For example, small slips of tongue and dreams can be interpreted as doorway to unconscious mind. Thus, this gives rise to the idea that humans do not act accordingly to their will, but functions on the processes running in the background. There is a lot to say about his works, but the time restricts such ability. Jill Deleuze Yes, as cliche as it sounds, he is another French philosopher from the 20th century. In his early days, he wrote about David Humes and Nietzsche to highlight the contrast between both of them. Through this comparison, he exhibited the limit of human reason and mocked traditional philosophy, which tries to find the ultimate nature of reality. He further criticized in other works that traditional metaphysics had a tree-like character, where reality is visualized in terms of hierarchy, order and linearity. Thus he came up with his own concept of rhizome, an underground road which grew aimlessly and disorderly. In his major publication in collab with Felix Guthari, called anti oedipus was a critique of psychoanalysis and concept of Oedipus, discussing that these concepts were designed to suppress human desire and create normalization. Thus they portray psychophrenia as a heroic expression of non-social conformity. Looks like discussing Freud kinda came in handy, eh? Samuel Beckett An Irishman and a philosopher enter the pub. Yep, that's the joke. Well at least Beckett was a master of humor unlike me. Most of his idiosyncratic works offered a bleak outlook on existence and experience, with some good old dark humor. He saw superficial aspects of life as cover to basic anguish of human condition. Who are we? What is the true nature of the self? What does the word I mean? In his play Waiting for Godot, his main heroes are in the most basic situation of being in the world and not knowing what they are there for. But as a human is rational, they cannot just assume that they are there for nothing. Thus, coming to the conclusion that they are there waiting for someone named Godot without knowing whether he exists or not. Cool. Another existential crisis. Max Stirner He was a German philosopher and a social critic, best known for writing Ego and His Own, in which he described human as a self-interested ego, thus each individual should be able to express their individuality without any restrictions. Sounds pretty sus when you work as a teacher at a girl's school. Ok, I should stop making assumptions. In his work, he further writes how a person is in the center of his own moral universe. Thus actions a person takes will be considered as his self-mastery. He declared that I am my own when I am a master of myself instead of being mastered by anything else. Thus he came up with the term ownness. This leads to the idea of individualist anarchism, where no sovereign authority such as government or church can stop a human to pursue his own individual self-interest. He died after getting stung on the neck by an insect. Seemed like insect also wanted to express its individuality. Level 5 Diogenes We start with the original mad lad who once said, I pissed on a man who called me a dog. Why was he surprised? He was one of the cynics who stressed stoic self-sufficiency and rejected luxuries of life. In further detail, he did not just disregard luxuries but also laws and customs of conventional societies. He himself lived in extreme poverty with little or no belongings to show that one can find happiness even under such circumstances. Such happiness wasn't found anywhere but created within oneself. His second principle, shamelessness, meant that one can perform acts that disregarded social conventions in every situation. So next time when you have a family dinner, give yourself a quick wank in front of everyone to show that you hold the knowledge of the absolute mad lad. Julius Evola When you hear someone called a most radical, anti-democratic, anti-liberal, anti-egalitarian and anti-popular political philosopher, then he's Evola. He was mystic who believed in Tantra, Hermeticism and ritual magic. 
But I am not interested in what he believed, but what he philosophizes. He came up with an idea called magical idealism. His early works tried to convert neo-idealism from a philosophy of absolute spirit and mind to the philosophy of absolute individual and action. He stated that the ego must understand that everything that seems to have a reality independent of it is nothing but an illusion caused by its own deficiency, which meant one needed to become the absolute individual to gain the unconstrained liberty and unconditional power. Unsurprisingly, he was also an advocate of no fab, a definite incel. Jack Lacan He was the man who introduced the Freudian theory into France during the 1930s but gained the much needed attention in the later stages of his career, which was in the 1960s when he published his essays and lectures in Ecrits, thus giving him a celebrity status. He emphasized that language was an essential part of the unconscious, thus introducing the language element in psychoanalytical theory. One of his famous concepts was the three orders of Lacan, which were the imaginary, symbolic, and the real. This idea's clearest description was given by Zizek in an analogy of a chess game, where the rules of chess through which the game functions are the symbolic. The chess pieces which are given a shape and names are the imaginary, and the intrusion of my cat while I play chess, which is the contingent circumstances being outside the game, are the real. Lacan is overly complex, so let's move on. George Edward Moore not the footballer, but quite the realist philosopher, who took a systematic approach to ethical problems. His time at Cambridge was defined by the journal articles he wrote, which included the nature of judgment and the refutation of idealism, plus the major ethical work, Principia Ethica, which tried to give ethics a better foundation through logic. Thus these writings together helped him disestablish the influence of Hegel and Kant over English philosophy. His ethical intuitionism also contributed to moral relativism, where he claimed that what is good requires analysis of the desire and approval which are not inherently related to ethics. Consequently, a fallacy occurs which he named naturalistic fallacy. Frederick Hayek Wait a minute, I thought he was an economist. Oh, I just learned that he contributed to the areas of philosophy of science, the free will problem and epistemology. Fair enough, fair enough. Skipping most of his economic work, I will jump to 1940s, when he worked on his abuse of reason project. It was a critique of several doctrines that he merged together, labeling it as scientism, which he defined as the slavish imitation of method and language of science, used where the natural sciences could not be used. The same idea led him to write his two major works which were The Road to Serfdom and The Sensory Order. While in his political philosophy side of things, he criticized socialism over its restrictions of the free market and defended the liberalistic approaches to the market. Well, a free market is the reason why GameStop's share skyrocketed. Jack Derrida There are so many influential French philosophers that you can make a football team out of them. Derrida is also part of the team, being a critic of Western philosophy and an analytic of nature of language. He is most celebrated for coining the term deconstruction, which was used in the critical examination of Western philosophy since the times of ancient Greeks. Deconstruction is an approach to breaking down complex concepts and understanding the meaning between the relationship of text and meaning. For example, one can read a novel twice over its lifetime and each time interpret the meaning of the text differently. Derrida in his other works such as Writing and Difference and Speech and Phenomena explored how Edmund Husserl, Rousseau and other philosophers treated writing. Although many people complained about his incomprehensible writings, but oh well, they small brain. Gitebo Oh, he is my guy, said no one ever, hey. Anyhow, aside the puns, he was a Marxist theorist and a filmmaker, a unique combination I might say. His renowned works included The Society of the Spectacle and several autobiographies. Debeau was greatly irritated by the hegemony of the government and media over everyday life through mass production and consumption. He wrote that the pop culture, mass media and advertisement in shape of images controlled the social relation between people, thus he called the phenomena the spectacle. He developed notions of fetishism of the commodity further along with the analysis of spectacular society. Guy Debeau actively organized Situationist International, a political movement attempting to create a class struggle against the spectacle. Although the political movement was dissolved in 1972, 
so he instead continued to make abstract ass films. Alexander Dujin The first person that is alive on this list. Amazing! And what's furthermore, he is called the Putin's Rasputin. Dujin sports the geopolitical concept of design. Through such bases, he claims that the liberal capitalist West is the complete opposite of what the ancient Greek idealized, thus the revolt of Earth against the heavens. Instead, he envisions the unification of all Russian-speaking countries to create the Eurasian Empire, which would be capable of fighting the US-led Western world. In the basics of geopolitics, he writes, In principle, Eurasia and or space, the heartland Russia, remain the staging area of anti-bourgeois, anti-American revolution. The new Eurasian Empire will be constructed on the fundamental principle of the common enemy, the rejection of Atlanticism, strategic control of the USA, and a refusal to allow liberal values to dominate us. This common civilizational impulse will be the basis of political and strategic union. Level 6 Reza Well, due to family-friendly content, I shall not say his last name. She has contributed to research journals such as Collapse, Sea Theory, but mainly he is associated with speculative realism and rationalist universalism, which covers the beginning of evolution of modern system of knowledge and advancing towards contemporary philosophies of rationalism. After that, he turned to rationalist inhumanism, according to which concept of human is underexplored, thus further investigation will lead to a new concept of human that stands opposite to the concept of human essentialism and humanism. In his research, he deals with philosophy of intelligence, AI, and neuroscience, and questions what is intelligence. Well, my answer to him is that intelligence is something I lack. Thomas Metzinger More like Metzinger Burger. Okay, please forgive me. He is a German philosopher active since the 1990s in the promotion of consciousness studies as an academic endeavor. His book, Being No One and Ecoternal, argues that self does not exist. It is only a model created by our brain. Everything we experience is a virtual self in a virtual reality. The only self which does exist is the phenomenal self of conscious experience. The book further questions whether we still have souls, free will or accountability. Metzinger disagrees with the hard problem of consciousness, which explains how we have qualia or phenomenal experiences. He denies that qualia actually exists through logical backing and use of proper neuroscience. I don't know his arguments yet, but going through his works will indeed give me some interesting insight. Rene Quino Also known as Abdul Wahid Jahia, who was also influential in the doctrine of metaphysics. He seems interesting in the fact that he proposed an individual to apply directly some aspects of Eastern philosophy into their lives while keeping faithful to their spirit. In his first published book, An Introduction to the Study of Hindu Doctrines, he points out that misinterpretation of Western Orientalism and Neo-Capitalism and gives a rigorous explanation of Eastern metaphysics. Renegino's work is usually divided into four parts, that being fundamental metaphysics principles, initiation and esotericism, studies in symbolism and criticism of the modern world, and neo-spiritualism. For him, symbolism held an essential and spontaneous echoing power. Symbolism was a metaphysical language at its highest, thus capable of relating all degrees of universal manifestation and the components of being. Thomas Ligotti He was influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. Well, looks like things are about to get dark then. Thomas Ligotti is a contemporary horror writer, but also known for his pessimistic and nihilistic world outlook. His non-fiction work, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, is a philosophical take on the horror of the real and the dread of self. He describes the relationship between the structure of experience and real merged together to create an experience of the real, but then turning the real world inside out to show that it was unreal all along. Interestingly, Ligotti follows Thomas Metzinger's philosophy of consciousness, where humans are not selves, but a self-model. Thus Ligotti comes to describe the Plato's cave as an organism, where the projections on the wall are the human's consciousness. The projections are there, but the cave itself is empty. Thank you for the third existential crisis. Slavoj Žižek Wait a minute, he's not as obscure though. Well, all the people who know about him think in that manner at least. 
Okay, I should stop before the salt comes my way. Anyhow, he is a Slovenian philosopher and a cultural theorist who was made renowned through his provocative yet humorous style. His first work in English, The Sublime Object of Ideology, was considered a masterpiece which was mostly a critique of the notion that one can escape ideology and independently live without it. Zizek writes that Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud both had found the kernel of meaning within unconnected forms of commodities and dreams, but in reality both did not hold any hidden value or meaning. He also rejected deconstruction of Derrida and postmodernism of Lyotard, ultimately seeing them as a manifestation of commodification and homogeneity of culture under global capitalism. Okay, before moving on, I want to share one of Zizek's jokes. He says, Throw out this destitute beggar. I'm so sensitive that I can't see people suffering. Level 7 Edward von Hartmann The philosopher of the unconscious. Damn, what name he got. This mad lad tried to reconcile the opposing school of thoughts, rationalism and irrationalism through the concept of the unconscious mind. This was done in his book, The Philosophy of Unconscious. Hartmann's idea was based on the single phenomena, which obviously was human unconsciousness, which evolved through three stages. The first stage is where the will and reason were united as the absolute spiritual principle of existence, but then they were separated when the man had his fall. The second stage was called the cosmic, in which consciousness led human to chase happiness. The human currently lives in this stage where the will and the reason compete, thus making life a misery. Once the misery reaches its maximal limit, then the man shall reach the third stage, where the reason defeats the will. Human will have temptation for suicide, but this will be overcome by rational thinking. He finally writes, that human needs to devote to social evolution instead of chasing the dreams of happiness that he will never reach. I break my impartiality to call this philosophy just beautiful. Quentin Messu. Okay, I'm done with butchering names, or maybe not, as this guy was a student of Alain Badiou, who wrote the foreword for his first book, After Finitude. It comes up with a new option regarding Immanuel Kant's three alternatives of criticism, scepticism, and dogmatism. He argues that post-Kantian philosophy is dominated by correlationism. The statement that defined correlationism being, humans cannot exist within the world, nor world without humans. He argues that avoiding such concept creates problem of describing the world which is prior to all human access. To solve the issue, he suggests that mathematics is the only way to reach the primary qualities of things, instead of the secondary qualities that we experience instead. Well, I'm out of here if math is the only way to solve my problems. Peter Singer The guy was once titled as the most dangerous man in the world. But look at this smile, does he look teeny bit dangerous at all? He is an Australian-born ethical political philosopher who is best known for his bioethics and animal rights movements. Singer's works are mostly around the ethics and political activism led by the utilitarianist philosophy, thus promoting happiness and preventing pain. He argued that the moral obligation does not limit to the duty, but charity, as well as any action, becomes a duty if it prevents more pain and causes more happiness. In the publication of Animal Liberation, he brought attention to animal rights and stated that all beings with interest deserve to have their interest taken into account when making a moral decision. But man, that smile still makes me happy. Herman Tonison. This guy barely has any articles on him. On top, he's Norwegian, thus making things even harder. The only accessible essay of his is called Happiness is for Pigs. He tried to be the better version of Zappa, another fellow Norwegian philosopher. He went against the metaphysical statement that life is meaningless by replacing it with that life is not even meaningless. He writes that we live a life worthy of an authentic man, even when we are aware that this is an illusion, a self-deception, where man is nothing but an intelligent pig with a sense of cleanliness and indoor plumbing. Well, I beg to differ, because pigs cannot really create memes. Checkmate bruh. Peter Vesel Zappa. Well here comes another Norwegian with a difficult name. The philosopher who the last guy was obsessed with. 
As we already know that he had a pessimistic view of human life and was a supporter of antinatalism, which in short was a philosophy where you abstain from giving birth. Oh well, he views that humans are too overdeveloped which doesn't fit with nature's design. Thus humans tend to search for satisfaction and justification for matters over life and death. Ultimately, humans try not to be human by going against the nature, thus a paradox. In Last Messiah, he gives four points through which man tries to avoid this paradox. 1. Isolation One isolates itself from the consciousness of destructive thought or feeling. 2. Anchoring One anchors itself to society, religion and morality. 3. Distraction One distracts itself by focusing on a specific task. 4. Sublimation One sublimates the negative energy towards something more positive. Well, there goes my sanity. Woodard? Seriously, who is this? I found few people call this but no one who stood out. I'm sorry to any Woodards who are watching this though. Level 8 Marcion of Sinope To start we go as back to the 85. Yup, just 85 AD. I'm not gonna go in detail of what he did or said because he's connected more to the theological world rather philosophical. The basis of his thought was that there were two cosmic gods, one who demanded justice and created the man, body and the soul, while the other god having no relation to the first god sent Jesus Christ to save man from materialism. Well, this was today's dose of wacky theology. Julio Cabrera A philosopher from South America Seems like we are getting real international here. Julio has largely played a contribution through his work on negative ethics. In his book A Critique of Affirmative Morality, where he criticizes normative ethical system which considers life and existence are intrinsically good. He argues that life is structurally bad instead thus one can never lead a good life. In short, he thinks that to live is to be immoral. He also, being an antinatalist, argues that procreation is an act of manipulation and harm as children are created due to their aesthetical value, thus not for their own sake, but for the sake of their parents. Well, I think I did not even fulfill my aesthetical duty. Makes sense why I am a disappointment. David Benatar Seems like many people nowadays regret their own birth. As Benatar is also an antinatalist, I mean it is pretty clear from the title of his book, Better Never To Have Been, The Harm Of Coming Into Existence. He argues from the premises that pain is a bad thing. Thus the argument follows that 1. Presence of pain is bad. 2. Presence of pleasure is good. 3. The absence of pain is good, even if that good cannot be experienced. 4. The absence of good is not bad unless there is somebody deprived of it. As bringing someone into existence generates both good and bad experiences, while not existing generates no pain and pleasure, thus from asymmetry of good and bad, that it is better for one not to be born. Cool, 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 cool. Makweda Sada. If you were wondering where the word sadism originated from, well, here's the guy who popularized it. But my god, his life is one hella adventure. I don't want YouTube to be angry so I shall refrain from talking about it here. While he was in jail, he wrote erotic novels to overcome his boredom and anger. These works had an elemental philosophical discourse with sexual fantasies, violence and suffering. Desada was a proponent of absolute freedom, unconstrained by morality, religion or law. His writings and his own life were famous for libertinism, where it states that one is devoid of most moral principles, sense of responsibility or sexual restraints, thus being a radical form of hedonism where pleasures experienced through senses are of utmost importance. Now this is a philosophy I can get behind at least. No puns intended. Leonosuke Kutagawa He's the most widely translated Japanese writer and even inspired legendary director Akira Kurosawa. He was popularized in West for his short stories which consisted of human dilemmas and struggles of conscience. Okotagawa in Rashomon wrote a tale of encounter between a servant and an old woman who weaved wigs from dead corpses. This depicted the world's survivalism and short-term morality for self-preservation. He was heavily influenced by European fiction and philosophy. 
especially by Franz Kafka. After the age of 25, he developed hints of madness and will to die. His writings began to show increasing self-observation as he wrote his prophetic essay called What is Proletariat Literature, which pondered the future of art. At age 35, he ended his life by poisoning, but before dying, he wrote a letter called A Note to a Certain Friend, where he described his disinterest with life and his anticipation of peace with death. Osamu Tazai Another Japanese author who drowned himself with his lover, at least his work survived from which no longer human is most popular outside Japan. This novel and others were semi-autographical, giving insight into his unstable life. His pessimism made him resemble Camus, but unlike Camus, who was focused on politics and philosophy, the Zai focused on personal reflections of estrangements. This estrangement was not only from the society, but an idea of human being estranged from being human, and consequently from existence. His characters at each stage of the novel tend to become more confused and bewildered, finding them to become older but not wiser. His main question was whether being human was not a solution, but instead a problem. The book No Longer Human ends where human is disqualified from being human. To become a non-entity that is not part of the society, but drawn to the unhuman world of sky, rain, sand and sea. Philip Mindlander Well here we go to the deepest of abbeys where a philosopher such as he was born in 1841 through marital rape. It is no wonder why he is known as the most radical pessimist. He proclaimed that will ignited by the knowledge that not being is better than being is the supreme moral principle. He built his philosophy around the same metaphysical framework of Schopenhauer. But what differentiated him was silencing the will. For Mindlander, the cosmos was moving to silence the will to live, which he called the redemption. In his book The Philosophy of Salvation, he writes about how the world was a singularity, a single will which was dispersed into individual wills. When this individual will die out, then the redemption is received in the form of absolute nothingness. Due to such basis, the will to live thus becomes will to die. He further justifies why the will to die is best for the happiness of all through the realization that all pursuit and craving leads to pain. Now my mission to bring you to the deepest layer of the philosophers is complete. But before I go back into my cave of illusion, I want to share Mindlander's quotation from the philosophy of redemption. But at the bottom, the imminent philosopher sees in the entire universe only the deepest longing for absolute annihilation. And it is as if he clearly hears the call that permeates all spheres of heaven. Redemption, redemption, that do over life. And the comforting answer, you will all find annihilation and be redeemed. <laughs>